Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Revelation. Tonight will be study number 25 of Revelation chapter 1. And we're continuing to look at verse 7 of Revelation 1. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. And we've been taking our time and and moving carefully through the verse, making sure we try to cover everything that the phrases in this verse might apply to. And we've come to the point of the closing part of the verse, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. And tonight we want to look at the word kindreds, kindreds. And uh, this particular Greek word, phule, phule, it's Strong's number 5443. And by the way, I tell you that so you can check it out. So you can follow along with what we're saying about it, the verses that we're going to. And if you have a concordance, you would need a concordance to turn to that number. And you'll see if what is being said is correct or not. And you can also find all the places in the Bible that this word is used. Now, we're not going to be able to go to every place this word is found. It's found 30 times in the New Testament, but we'll go to a good number of them. And of the 30 times phule is found in the New Testament, 24 times it is translated as tribe or tribes, plural. And six times, the remaining six times, it's translated as kindred or kindreds as we have in our verse in Revelation 1, verse 7. Now, to see how this verse is used, we're, we're going to go a little further in the book of Revelation to Revelation chapter 7, where we're going to find it in just a few short verses. This same Greek word, phule, will be found 14 times, almost half of the 30 Half of the times it's found in the Bible is found in this passage in Revelation 7, beginning in verse 4, where it says, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes, that's phule, of the children of Israel, of the tribe of Judah. Now, every time I mention the word tribe, It's that same word we're looking at. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Aser were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. Now in verses 4 through 8, uh, Phule is found 13 times. And every time it's translated as tribe or tribes. And it's referring, well, God is is making reference to the tribes of Israel. But, of course, he's talking about those that are saved. And 12,000 from each of the tribes, 12 tribes. And, and that would total 144,000. Now, these 144,000... Um, are not 144,000 Jews, descendants of Abraham. This is a number and a figure that God is using, a type and a figure, to typify all those that he would save during the church age, as God likens 
the 144,000 to the first fruits in Revelation chapter 14. And the first fruits, the, the Pentecostal harvest, as if you remember in Acts 2, God began to pour out his spirit on the day of Pentecost, and, and that began the church age and the bringing in of the first fruits. And so God likens the 144,000 to all those that became saved during the 1955 years of the church age from 33 AD until 1988. And, and so these uh, 12,000 from this tribe and 12,000 from that tribe, but from 12 tribes of Israel, is a figure of speech to typify the elect, the elect of God. There was far more than 144,000 that God saved over those many centuries. And although it, it wasn't what we would have thought, yet certainly more than 144,000, perhaps a handful of million, we don't know for sure. But the 144,000 represent the sum of the total of the elect that God saved throughout the church age. And they were people, some were Jews, and and many were Gentiles. God is not uh, bound to say that he only saved individuals from these particular tribes. That's the type and figure that God is using, and we have to understand that. Well, this does mean that these 13 instances are representative of the elect, the, the Greek word phule, is 13 times we know out of the 30 pointing to the elect through this language. And then we come to verse 9 of Revelation 7, and it says, Thereafter this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. And here the English word kindreds is the same word that's been translated as tribe or tribes and that it, it's our word in Revelation 1 verse 7. And again, it's referring to, um, in this case, the elect, although it's of, it says, that's an important word, of all nations, a great multitude that will be clothed in white robes indicating God saved them, of all nations and the, of the kindreds and of the people and of the tongues. It's, it's not all nations and all kindreds or all tribes, but it's of them. And so we, we have to keep that in mind. Now, we looked at tribes. I just want to go one other place uh, in Revelation 21, where Phule is translated as tribes. In verse 12, it says, And had a a wall great and high, this is describing the new Jerusalem, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Again, are the same word, and again pointing to the elect, because the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, as well as the 12 apostles of the Lamb in the New Testament are used of God here as, as a representation of all those saved in the Old Testament and those saved in the New Testament. And, and so this word identifies very much with the people of God. Well, um, kindreds is, is, is found six times. Fule is translated as tribe or tribes 24 out of the 30 times and six times it's translated as kindred or kindreds our verse in revelation 1 7 the verse we just read in revelation 7 verse 9 and i want to read the other four times that we'll find this word translated as kindred it's all in the book of revelation in revelation chapter 5 verse 9 and they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain 
and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Now again, this is referring to those redeemed, the elect, and they're out of every kindred, every tribe. Could this be referring to the fact that God saves from the tribes of Israel as well as the other people of the world? Well, it could. It could. But um, I don't know if we'll find an answer to that. Let's just keep looking at um, the other places. Three more verses. Revelation 11, verse 9. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Now here kindreds would seem to just refer to unsaved people that are in the world and and they're not suffering the dead bodies of the two witnesses to be put in graves. And then in Revelation 13 verse 7, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. This referring to the beast that comes up out of the sea. And here the the beast is referring to Satan's rule uh, in the world during the great tribulation. A little later, we'll see another beast coming up out of the earth with uh, two horns like a lamb. And that is pointing to Satan's rule in the churches. So again, the kindred here would apparently be pointing to people of the world. And then one last verse, Revelation 14, verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And so that is all of the instances that the Greek word phule is translated as kindred or kindreds. One thing you might have noticed is that in every other verse, where we find this word translated as kindred or kindreds, it is in association with nation, tongue, and people. Except uh, one place in Revelation 13, verse 7, it was just tongues and nations and people were not mentioned. But five places, five out of the six, where kindred is found, it is in association or in conjunction with these other words to describe the people of the world. And the only exception to that is Revelation 1 verse 7. Normally we could say that where this word is found without those other words, people, nations, and tongues, it is translated as tribe or tribes. In every instance, but in Revelation 1, verse 7. And let me read it again to remind you what this verse says. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Well, we we could certainly replace the word kindreds here with the plural word tribes. And it, it would read, And all tribes of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And that reminds us of what we find in Matthew chapter 24. Let's turn to Matthew 24 and... I'll begin reading in verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, 
and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. That that is our Greek word fully. And here it, it's by itself. That is, we don't read of nations and people and tongues. And so it, it's a plural word and, and God translates it as the plural word tribes. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. We, we really have a lot of similarities with our verse in Revelation 1 verse 7 and this verse. Because Revelation 1 7 uh, speaks of the Lord coming in the clouds. And let's see, there's I think at least three similarities. Revelation 1 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. That's the first thing. As Matthew 24 30 uh, tells us towards the end of the verse, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And the second thing uh, is they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. All tribes of the earth shall wail. And here in Matthew 24, 30, then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Well, it so happens that the word mourn is a translation of the same Greek word translated as wail. In our verse in Revelation 1, verse 7. So we have three identical elements. We have Christ coming in the clouds. We have the tribes of the earth wailing. Or the kindreds of the earth wailing. And, and here, the tribes of the earth mourning. And they're saying the same thing. And th this is helping us to realize that the ones that are seeing Christ coming in the clouds, these tribes of the earth that are mourning, are true believers. I, I think we can safely say that as we look at this Greek word, phule, and how many times it identifies with the people of God, either Israel of historic and national Israel, uh, we, we didn't look in many places, but when the Apostle Paul says he is of the tribe of Benjamin, that's our word. So there would be a reference to historical Israel and one of their tribes. Or we've seen that it refers to 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel. That would be spiritual Israel, Israel of God, those elect that God saves and and counts them as spiritual Jews because they have been circumcised uh, in heart as the Bible speaks of it. That is when we become born again and our sins are cut off. We are circumcised in a spiritual way and we become part of the Israel of God. So this Greek word phule, the tribes of the earth, would point to the true believers. The only exception to this is when it's found in conjunction with the other words, uh, people, nations, and tongues. And then it could indicate just people of the world, of the various tribes of the earth. But normally when it's found alone, as it is in Revelation 1 verse 7, and as it is here in Matthew 24 verse 30, it identifies, again, either with national Israel or spiritual Israel. And here it, it would seem to identify with the true believers. They are the ones, the tribes of the earth, that are mourning when they see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And what is that sign? Well, remember what Luke 21 says in Luke 21, verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Here the signs are in the sun, moon, and stars. And, and of course, they're in the heavens. 
They're in the sky above and they're the celestial lights and they are the types that God is using to illustrate that the light of the gospel and when they go dark, when the sun is darkened and the moon's not giving its light and the stars fall, it is the figure that God is using to illustrate the removal of the light of the gospel from this world. That is the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. It's the heaven that the Bible unfolds as the scriptures likened to a scroll are open. God established these lights in the heavens above, uh, spiritually speaking. And at the beginning of the day of judgment on May 21 in 2011, God folded up. He rolled up the scroll that the Bible had established and he put out the gospel lights and never again would he save anyone that had not become saved already. This is the sign of the Son of Man. That is, this is a sign in the Bible as that's the only place we're permitted to find a sign. This is uh, likened to the sign of Jonah, remember when the Jews were seeking after a sign and and the Lord Jesus said, no sign will be given an evil and adulterous generation, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And where could the sign of Jonah be found? Only in the Bible. That's where you read about Jonah and, and the history of Jonah when he was swallowed by a whale and vomited out and so forth. And the sign that God permits is in the scripture. And now we are privileged and blessed to have entered into the phase of God's judgment plan, of his final plan for mankind, where we are witnessing the sign of the Son of Man. What is this sign telling us? Well, when we see the sign that the sun is darkened and the moon is not giving its light, that is the law of God, the Bible, when we see the sign that the celestial lights that God has established are no longer in place, they're no longer shining, illuminating the earth, they're no longer providing salvation to sinners, then we know that Christ is coming in the clouds. He's, he's here as judge of the earth. And finally, it will result in the last day of this period and the last day of uh, earth's existence and the end of the world. This is why God says, when you see these things uh, come to pass, he, uh, he says this a little bit further on, In verse 33 of Matthew 24, So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, and keep in mind, see has to do with seeing with the eyes of understanding. When ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. That is, when you see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, God is saying it is near, because Christ has not yet destroy the earth. He has not yet created a new heaven, a new earth, and fulfilled all things and brought us uh, into the glorious eternal future that he has promised. But you can know, lift up your head, it says in another gospel, that it is near, that these things are close at hand, very close. We have gone through the great tribulation. Now we're in the time immediately after the tribulation. And uh, we're, we're progressing, in other words, through Matthew 24 and through God's overall plan. And now uh, the day of judgment is here and God will uh, complete his purpose for this. And, and then that'll be Um, everything that he has in store for this world. Now let's look at this idea here that the tribes of the earth that are mourning are true believers. 
And this leads us back to Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah 12, and we're going to um, begin in verse 9. We looked at this the other day. And it says in Zechariah 12, verse 9, And shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem, as the mourning of Hadarimmon in the valley of Megiddo. And I'll stop reading there. Now, th this passage is becoming more and more interesting as we are continually being led back to it. And we saw before that this has to be the elect in view. As verse 10 says, I will pour upon the house of David. And David is another name of Christ. And upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And again, God likens the elect to Jerusalem, the figure in the book of Revelation of the Jerusalem above is the bride of Christ. It consists of all the elect. And notice that God will pour upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And, and it is by grace we are saved. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. We pierce Christ because he died for our sins and our transgressions. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. Now this would have to be the true believers that are mourning. God's people, the elect. And, and then it speaks of a great mourning in Jerusalem. And again, following the context, it would seemingly be referring to Jerusalem above. The people of God are mourning. And the, the language of looking upon him whom they pierced, well, Revelation 1, 7 ties that to the day of judgment. But look at how this passage opened up in verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day that it will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? If we thought this referred to um, the first coming of Christ, then that statement in verse 9 doesn't seem to fit. But if we understand that as referring to God's judgment on the churches, then that makes it much more interesting. 